Welcome back. Our guest tonight is a historian, philosopher and best-selling author of Sapiens, Homo Deus and 21 Lessons for the 21st Century. He has one of the brightest minds of anyone on the planet. I've wanted to have Yuval as a guest for the last couple of years and this feels like perhaps the perfect time. He's going to talk to us about what the world might look like once this storm passes. He's joining us today from his home near Jerusalem, Yuval Noah Harari. Thank you so much for joining us, Yuval. Thank you for inviting me. How are you, uh, how are you bearing up over there? Are you, are you okay? Uh, yes, I think so. My husband and me are locked up in our house on the outskirts, actually between Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. And uh, more busy than ever. Well, but, I'm uh, sure yeah, that doesn't uh, surprise me because time. you do have one of those minds that I think people look to in times like this. I know that I do. And so I want to dive straight in. The, the first thing I'd like to know is how do you think the world will be different when we've got through this pandemic? That completely depends on our decisions. It's not predetermined. It's not deterministic. It's our choices. We have a lot of big choices to make. One big choice is whether we deal with this crisis through nationalistic isolation, each country competing with all the others for the scarce resources, or whether we deal with it through international solidarity and cooperation. And which this will shape not just the crisis, but also the world for years to come. Similarly, on the level of each individual country, each country has to choose whether it deals with the crisis uh, in an authoritarian way by empowering some dictator or some powerful authority, or whether it deals with the crisis by empowering the citizens and keeping democratic checks and balances. And we see different countries adopting very different approaches. And this will obviously shape these countries for years to come, not just for a few weeks. I mean, the coming weeks are the critical point in which these decisions are being made. Whoever comes afterwards, it's like coming to a party after the party is over and the only thing left to do is to wash the dishes. I mean, now they are handing out trillions of dollars. They are changing the job market, the educational system. Whoever comes in 2021 will find it very, very difficult to kind of rewind the movie and try something else. I mean, there's such mistrust uh, of politicians, um, scientists right now aren't being heard and listened to in the manner that I think they probably should be. Why do you think this is? And trust is a fundamental issue in all of this, right, Yuva? Yeah, without trust, we can't deal with this crisis effectively. Uh, in recent years, we had populist politicians and irresponsible politicians that deliberately undermined trust in public authorities, in science, in, in the media. And now we are paying the price for it. You know, in normal times, maybe you can run a country when only half the population trusts the government, maybe. But in an emergency like this, you need 100% of the people to trust the government and, and, and the authorities. If you get advice from the uh, head of government on TV and half the population goes and says, well, this person has been lying to me for years. Why should I believe it now? It's going to be very difficult to handle the crisis. I think the good sign though, is that at least when it comes to science and scientific authority, we see that almost all over the world, people have a hidden reservoir of deep trust in science, despite the recent years of attacks on, on, on science. Uh, in my home country of Israel, uh, the government closed down the synagogues. In Iran, they closed down the mosques. Churches all over the world are telling people, stay away from the church. Why? Because the scientists said so. So even these religious establishment, when it comes to a real emergency, they trust in science more than in anything else. And that's a good sign. I hope after the crisis is over, people will remember who they really trusted in the moment of truth. And afterwards, when scientists warn us about things like ecological collapse or climate change, we take it with the same trust and in, in the same seriousness that we now listen to the scientists telling us about epidemics. 
when we move forward, how do you think this time will impact um, how we socially interact with each other going forward? What do you think the big changes will be? There could be big changes in an institutional way in the job market, again, in universities. If some universities move online, then this will create a completely different social atmosphere for the students. And when I went to university or to school, the most, some of the most interesting and important things happened in the breaks. Yeah. But then when all the classes are on Zoom, I mean, there are no, you can't meet the other students in, in, in the break. So some things are going to change dramatically, perhaps, but the fundamentals of human nature will not change. We are social animals. We like very, very much like contact. Uh, when somebody is sick, we usually want to come and, and help them. The virus is exploiting this against us. So we now need to change our behavior. But I don't think we need to worry about a fundamental change in human nature. Uh, you know, the Black Death didn't change human nature. The 1918 influenza epidemic didn't change human nature. And COVID-19 also will not change human nature. If you look at the, maybe the last big epidemic in much of the world, like in the US, at the AIDS epidemic, which was in many ways much worse than what's happening now. And now if you get coronavirus, you have a very good chance of living. Mm. In the early 1980s, if you got AIDS, you died. It was a death, death sentence. And compared to what governments are doing now, in the early 1980s, uh, people were abandoned in many cases by the state. And especially, you know, politicians saying, well, this is punishment from God yeah. to gay people. It will be good to get rid of them. And actually, the LGBT community came out of the AIDS epidemic much stronger than it entered it. Uh, people discovered a lot of uh, strength in themselves. They established voluntary organizations to help sick people to spread reliable information, to fight for political recognition and, and, and action. And again, AIDS didn't change human nature. So COVID-19 will certainly not do it. See, even just hearing you say that has made me feel so much better. Because that's <laughs> been my made my, the, the thing that's been freaking me out is the, the notion of saying, well, what will it be like after this? But you do think that there is some hope to be found the other side of this. Yeah, it, it's going to be long and difficult for some people more, more, more than to others. But, you know, humankind, we have everything, for the first time in history, actually, we have everything we need to overcome this epidemic. Above all, a good scientific understanding of what causes the disease and how to prevent it from spreading. During the Black Death, maybe the biggest problem was ignorance. People were dying in their millions all around you, and nobody had any idea why people were dying and what could be done about it. The medical faculty in Paris, in the University of Paris, their best estimate was that this is something to do with the astrological position of the stars. This was their best guess. Wow. Many other people said that it was punishment from God. So we just need to go to church and, and pray for God's forgiveness. Nobody had any idea it's a pathogen, tiny pathogen, coming from fleas on rats. Even a hundred years ago, during the big 1918 influenza, during the epidemic itself, the best scientists were working on it and nobody discovered what was the actual virus causing the epidemic. Now, it took just two weeks to identify the correct virus, sequence its entire genome and develop reliable tests. So we are really in a better position than in any time before. Uh, we have the scientific knowledge. What we don't necessarily have is the political wisdom to make use of, of our immense power. Maybe the biggest problem of all is the lack of international cooperation and of global solidarity. I'm not so afraid of the virus. I'm much more afraid of the inner demons of humanity coming out, people reacting to this crisis, not with solidarity, but with hatred or with greed. That's, that's the biggest danger we face. But because historically, if you, during the Ebola, for example, 
the, 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 the G7 leaders came together and it was President Obama who was really leading those discussions. Yeah. The President of the United States right now doesn't seem too interested in doing such a thing. Who are the other world leaders that we could look to for guidance during this? And do you think that's something that will happen? Well, at present, it seems that there are really no adults in the room. Nobody is taking the global responsibility. And therefore, we don't have a global plan of action, not in the field of healthcare, and certainly not in the economic field. Many countries are looking just about their own interests and competing with the other countries for the scarce resources, like medical equipment. Traditionally, the US was the responsible adult that in a case like the Ebola epidemic or the 2008 financial crisis mm. stepped forward to be the leader of humanity and in both cases managed to gather enough countries around it to, uh, to prevent the worst outcomes. Now the US has basically abdicated its role as global leader, basically says, I don't want this job. Um, I care only about myself. And when you look at the actual response of the US in its own house to the epidemic, maybe it's not such a good, such a bad thing that it's not responsible for the world because it's doing worse than almost any other country. Not just, you know, they compare it to China often, but not just to China, you compare it to South Korea, to New Zealand, even to Greece. Greece is doing an amazing job in containing this epidemic. If I had to choose, say, between Greece and the United States, who should be leading the world now, giving us a plan of action? I would definitely choose Greece. Wow, that's quite depressing. Now, you've all, you wrote a piece in the Financial Times where you talked about smartphones and governments using that technology uh, and, and a greater threat of surveillance. Can you talk to me about this? And do you think ultimately this is a, a good or a bad thing for civilization? It could be good, but we need to be very careful about it. What's happening now, it's really a watershed in the history of surveillance. First of all, we see mass surveillance systems entering and being adopted in democratic countries, which previously resisted them. Secondly, we see the nature of surveillance changing from over-the-skin surveillance to under-the-skin surveillance. Over-the-skin surveillance is, say, the government or a corporation watching, monitoring where you go, what you buy, what you watch on television. Under the skin surveillance starts with monitoring your body temperature and blood pressure, but ultimately it's about hacking your body and brain and knowing what you're feeling each and every moment, not just pain or, or coughing, but you know, our emotions are a biological phenomena exactly like the flu or like uh, uh, heat, like temperature. So if you have a surveillance system that can tell you if somebody is sick, that same surveillance system can also tell you how they feel each and every moment. And just, you know, 10 years in the future, fast forward, North Korea, every citizen has to wear a biometric bracelet on the, on the arm, and you have to watch this big speech by big leader. And uh, when you watch the speech, they are watching what's happening in your body. You can smile and you can clap your hands, but if you're angry, they know. You have no control over what's actually happening in your body. So this is no longer science fiction. This is already within reach of present day technology. And the coronavirus epidemic can be this watershed event when governments going under our skin becomes acceptable. Yuval, Noah Harari, I could talk to you all day.